How do we ask God to have help with our unbelief? That's what we're going to talk about today in Mark 10. We kick off the chapter talking about divorce. It's sad when families break up, but it's also sad when the very people are using it as a mechanism to get rid of people, hurting people in the process, and not even caring about it. And the Pharisees come up to him again to test him. They're not asking a very smart rabbi question so that they can learn. They're doing this to test. And it says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus says, well, what did Moses tell you? Oh, well, Moses, you know, handed out divorce certificates. And Jesus tells him the truth. This was because of the hardness of your heart. God made them male and female and that, that the man leaves his father and his mother and holds fast to his wife. And the two become one flesh. And because they're no longer two, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, the reason, again, they were asking these questions is because the Pharisees had schools of thought that were divorcing their wives for any reason. If you're unpleased with your wife, if she's not pretty, if she is not doing her whole housely duties, you know, they were doing this divorce thing, even though they were told not to, other than the cases of adultery. And they were doing it left and right. Again, it's that plank and splinter thing, right? They're sitting there and asking him this question. Meanwhile, they're divorcing their wives. And again, at that time, when you divorced your wife, you were letting her be impoverished. She didn't take land. She didn't take the house. She didn't get money unless they were nice enough to give money, but probably not. And so you were basically sending her out. And then if she remarried, you would make her an adulterer. I mean, there was no winning in this case. And they were trying to trick Jesus by asking him these questions. It's, it would be like today, too. What, what kind of questions would we ask him? Well, Jesus, do you think we should have streaming movies that aren't very good for us? Because they knew that if Jesus said, no, you shouldn't have these bad streaming movies, they're not good for you, people would fall away from him. But instead, he tells them, he educates them about their own faith and about what Moses started up. And what they were doing to these women was wrong. He is convicting them of their own crimes against their wives. One of the disciples asked him again, I guess what I keep thinking about all of this when it comes to it is when God created us, he anticipated that marriage would be forever, that ever we would live in the Garden of Eden together forever, that we would take care of this planet, take care of each other, be kind to each other, and that sin would not enter this world. And yet, it did, because we chose wrongly. And because of this, and because of the way we sin, it's just not how God intended for any of this to go. God didn't intend marriage to break up. He meant it to be forever. We do horrible things to each other. And these Pharisees were doing horrible things to their wives that were going to have lifelong implications for them. And he is telling them that to their face. So then there were children around him. And so they were, people were bringing their children so that Jesus could touch them. And then the disciples, can you get this idea that they're getting annoyed? And since this is probably the gospel of Peter, maybe Peter was a little bit more annoyed than everybody. And Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a small child, shall not enter it. Kids get it. Parables are understandable by kids. I bet you you tell half the kids the parables Jesus tells them, they'll go like, oh, so the sower puts it on rocky ground. That's not going to grow there. You don't immediately understand it because the child hasn't learned all the garbage adults learn and ways of couching arguments and a way of sort of segmenting this belief from that belief. They get it. And that's where we should be like a child and accept God at his word, listen and hear and understand. And so then he blessed them. Again, countercultural. Many times children were considered insignificant. Sometimes children were cast out if they wanted a son and they got a daughter. Sometimes children were treated very poorly by the Roman society. I mentioned it before, but one of the first signs that people recognize Christians as different is because if they saw a child that was put out, left on a rock, thrown into the woods, thrown out to the wilderness because, well, he just didn't need another daughter, 
which happened in the Roman and Greek cultures. The Jewish culture treated children much better, but to the Romans, this stood out to them. The Christians would raise that child because Jesus let them understand that children are as important as anybody in the kingdom of heaven. So now we have the rich young man who comes up to Jesus again. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Again, what actions must I take to save myself? So Jesus questions him. Why do you call me good? No one's good except for God. Are, are you saying I'm God? And you know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your mother and father. Oh, you know what? I have done all these things since my youth. Since I was a kid, I did all of these things. And it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. It, this wasn't Jesus trying to trick him. This wasn't Jesus trying to send him away. And he says, you lack one thing. Sell what you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. Again, he knew that man's heart. And he knew what that one thing was that that man wouldn't do. We don't know that he didn't do it later. We don't know what that lesson taught him. He probably thought about it for the rest of his life. Who knows what happened after that point? But it says that he was disheartened and he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of possessions. And Jesus says to his disciples that it's hard for people who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they were like stunned about it. And I'm sure to the Romans, this would have mattered too, because again, these people made wage, you know, they had mo some money, probably they were a little bit more well off than many of the people they were guarding against in Israel. And then Jesus goes on to say, easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, the biggest animal I know to go through the tiniest thing. Why would he say such a thing? Because I think Jesus knows, and someone even mentioned, why does Jesus talk about sexual sins, money sins? So often, because someone, you know, people will do counts. Well, God talks about money 300, you know, I don't know how many times, but why, why does God talk about it? Because I think he knows that those two things will drag us away from God more than anything. Well, are you saying I can't live with my boyfriend and be a worshiper of God? Are you saying that I can't hoard all this money and do all the things I want to do and get into the kingdom of God? It lures us away. It is a temptation away from God. So then they were like, well, wait a minute, then who can be saved? And then Jesus says, with man, it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And so Peter, again, being bold, says, you know, we left everything to follow you. Peter, more than anybody, he, as far as we know, was the only apostle that was married. And he had a mother-in-law. We left everything, left our families, left our homes. And I left my fishing business, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where Jesus says that people who leave their homes, their mothers, their fathers, their children, their land, for the sake of the gospel, they'll get a hundredfold back, and even more so with persecution. And then he goes and says, many who will be first will be last, and many who will be last first. We heard this uh, said inside of Matthew. When I'm reading this, it comes so quickly after who's going to be the greatest, you know, the argument of which apostle will be greatest, and many who will be first will be last. And I thought, too, it's kind of interesting as well, that James ended up being the first apostle murdered for his faith. John, who lived in exile on an island and died last. So they are right there, the two sons of thunder, first and last. But I'm not sure that that's what it means, but that's kind of the first thought I had about it when I was thinking about it. But so many people think in order to be in high positions, these people are thinking like the chief rabbi and his sidekicks. They're thinking Augustus Caesar and his advisors who sit on his left and his right and help them rule all of Rome. It's about being a servant. It's about being like a child. That's who's first in the kingdom of God. And there's going to be people who are high up, like Caesar Augustus, who will not be first in the kingdom of God, even though they're here first on earth as leaders of great men. And I think it's important, too, to think about, you know, in fact, about the riches. Not every person who was rich was bad, fell away from God. This rich young man, Jesus knew his heart and knew what was going on in his heart. 
But Abraham was rich. David ended up rich. There were other people that we think of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who we think was rich. Lydia, Joseph of Arimathea, wealthy people. So while richness can make it harder for you to seek the things of the kingdom of God, doesn't mean that it's forbidden. Because again, with God, all things are possible. Jesus then talks about his death yet again and saying, as they were walking with him, we're going to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priest. We're getting more specific. And the scribes, they will condemn him to death. They will deliver him over to the Gentiles, the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Isn't this exactly the last week of Jesus' ministry on earth? Boy, people just don't get it. You know, they don't hear what he's actually saying. It's so wild, but I get it. There are things that God says to us, and sometimes we don't hear it either. So then Jesus heals a blind man called Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus, oh, Jericho is more over towards the Dead Sea. So it's a little bit of a distance away. And he was with the disciples and the crowd that were following him around. And Bartimaeus was a blind beggar, it says. And it, it's funny, too. It says, like, he's the son of Timaeus. Why would you give this guy's name in the scripture like that? And I think because they believed you could probably go find Bartimaeus. You could go find Timaeus and go talk to them and see how it is. When we have details about it, we can say, hey, you should go look up this person. They're the son of Bob. Go find Bob. He'll tell you all about it. And so then they cried out to Jesus and kept going over and over again. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And so people were getting, I think, annoyed and telling him to shut up. And they crying out more and more, have mercy on me. So Jesus stops, you know, call him. So they called the blind man, told him to come. He says, take heart, he is calling you. So the man throws off his cloak. He springs up and he comes to Jesus. What do you want from me? And the blind man says, please let me recover my sight. And he says, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. Why didn't he spit in his eye and do all the things before? Like I said, we're individuals and what matters to us is about individuals, expectations and people, and God treats us like different people. He doesn't do it in this case. But it's interesting because most of the people we talk about getting healed are not named. And we knew this guy. We know his name. And so it's just kind of interesting how this guy gets named when many of the people didn't. But again, Jesus commends this man on his faith saying, your faith has made you well. And yet again, someone asked the question and said, what is exactly the faith of the blind man that Jesus commended? It said that this man was determined, he crying out time and time again. His faith was in Jesus, the son of David, so he knows who Jesus is. He asked for Jesus to have mercy on him. Mercy is, again, giving someone what they don't deserve. And he submitted by calling him Rabbani, Anytime you see the word I, at the end of a Jewish word, it means my. Adonai, my Lord. Rabbanai, my rabbi. And he knew that Jesus could heal him, which was the faith that did make him well, meaning he, he was going along with them. He told him to go, you know, go your way, go your path. And that Bartimaeus picked his path. His path is with Jesus. That's kind of cool. All right, so that ends chapter 10. My meditation today is going to be about how persistence pays off. I can be, particularly with prayer and spiritual things, not very persistent. I'll say, you know, God, help me with this thing. I'm not persistent. I will pray for it once, and then I probably won't pray for it again. I try to pray for you every night. But for myself, I just don't do it. So I think I want to think a little bit more about people who were persistent with God and how. Jesus appreciated that. My prayer this week is in thanksgiving for God's rescue plan. He wanted us to live the life of Eden, that we would culture the garden. We would still create things. We would still make miraculous things. We would just do so without sin. And that's just not what we wanted for ourselves. I'm so thankful that God came up with this rescue plan for us. And what I'll share with others, I think is that 
concept of persistence with God, that God in so many cases wanted us to drive and be persistent. I think that's why he always liked Peter and the apostles, because it's not like the apostles went away. If they didn't understand something, if their hearts were hardened, they stuck by him nonetheless. I think the problem that this rich man had, it said that he was disheartened and went away. He decided that his way was not Jesus' way. And Bartimaeus decided his path was alongside Jesus. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to leave a review and tell a friend. Love to grow this podcast and have a big community going on. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you very much for listening. <music>